afternoon, everyone. It's a real pleasure today to uh, try a new format here. We're going to have a debate um, between uh, Dr. Pensina and our visitor, Dr. Schneiderman, um, about the new cholesterol gu guidelines. Dr. Schneiderman is a, uh, Ed the Edwards Professor of Cardiology and Professor of Medicine at McGill University, where he also is director of the Mike Rosenblum Laboratory of Cardiovascular Research at the Royal Victoria Hospital in Montreal. He received his MD from McGill University, where he stayed for his training in internal medicine and clinical cardiology, and then went to the University of California, San Diego, and studied uh, lipidology uh, there prior to returning to McGill. With uh, a number of colleagues across the country, um, he's identified the commonest dyslipoproteinemia associated uh, with coronary artery disease, hyper-TG, hyper-APOB. These studies have led to uh, a number of uh, investigations that have clarified the hepatic, uh, uh, sorry, the regulation of hepatic APOB secretion and uptake and release of fatty acids by adipose tissue. He has conducted extensive series of epidemiologic studies which have demonstrated APOB to be a superior uh, marker to LDL cholesterol for the risk of vascular disease. In the other corner today is our own Dr. Pensina. Who, uh, who joined the DCRI about a year ago, uh, within the past year. He is a professor of biostatistics and bioinformatics and is the, is the director of the bioinformatics program here at the DCRI. He is uh, a world expert in risk prediction models and uh, has chosen the brave task of debating the new cholesterol guidelines with Dr. Schneiderman. Please join me in welcoming both of them today. Thank you very much, Octal, for uh, the introduction, for the invitation. So the introductions, people might be wondering, what am I doing debating Dr. Snyderman? And I think you can attribute it to two things. One, my being a statistician, so I'm probably more bold, and the other, my being inexperienced, uh, trying to debate him. But there is a silver lining, and I want you to pay attention to something very important. In these presentations, in this debate, what I'll be presenting are indisputable facts. <laughs> what, just plain numbers. What Dr. Snyderman is going to be presenting are his conjectures. <laughs> <coughs> I'd like to acknowledge my colleagues who, who have participated uh, with me in this research. And okay, so what's the background? So in November 2013, the AHA and ACC issued new guideline for treatment of blood cholesterol to reduce atherosclerotic cardiovascular disease. And the title is important because it gives the intention of the guideline. We'll get back to it, but this is not a general lipid management guideline. It's a guideline about blood cholesterol to reduce CBD. So there is a clear purpose here, which is important. And the new guideline intended to be evidence-based Either the evidence exists or the evidence does not exist, and the authors of the guideline try to editorialize less than it's been done in the past, which created a lot of controversy. Uh, additionally, large controversy was created by the fact that the guideline, in a number of major ways, departed from the previous guideline called the ATP3, Adult Treatment uh, Panel Number 3 for Cholesterol. We'll go over these differences. So this guideline is changing things in a number of important ways. Uh, you probably have seen some of the media hype uh, after the guideline came out. There were many articles in popular media, not only scientific media, or mainly in popular media, really New York Times. and and others have uh, argued back and forth. Many of these articles, unfortunately, focused on issues that are tangential uh, to the real discussion. And hopefully, we'll get to the, to the real issues here. Uh, so the new guideline defines four statin benefit groups. Okay? So they don't say you need to receive statins or you need to receive treatment. They call it statin benefit groups. So they say, based on the evidence that we gathered, we identified four groups uh, of people who will benefit from, or are likely to benefit from statin treatment. So the main, cha main changes uh, to the previous guidelines include 
reducing the LDL cholesterol levels needed to initiate treatment in secondary prevention, people uh, already with cardiovascular disease, and in diabetics. They propose that a new risk function is used in primary prevention. And another important point is the new function has stroke as its component. So the ATP3 function was the, uh, derived in Framingham was hard coronary heart disease, which was either heart attack or coronary death as the endpoint of the function. The new function adds stroke to the equation, uh, which has important implications. And then they lower the threshold for high risk classification to seven and a half from 20% 10 year risk. So the direct recommendation was 20% under other conditions you could go lower with the threshold in ATP3. Here it's brought down to seven and a half with the new function. And what's very interesting, there are no LDL cholesterol levels that modulate treatment recommendation. So uh, ATP3 was more complicated and we'll go over this uh, a little bit here. So here is the contrast of the, two new of, the, of the two guidelines. So we have the condition and the benefit group. So among people with cardiovascular disease, per ATP3, you needed LDL to be above 100 to qualify for treatment. With the new guideline, the LDL level is not taken into account. If you've uh, experienced CVD, uh, you're a candidate for statin. You're expected to benefit from statin. If your LDL cholesterol is high above 190, and both guidelines agree here, you're a candidate. If you have diabetes, the threshold of LDL-C to initiate treatment is lowered from 100 in ATP3 down to 70 with the current guideline. And in people who don't satisfy any of the three conditions, well, the rule of ATP3 is quite complicated. We look if you have two risk factors, so two of those here, age 45 in men, 55 in women, smoking, hypertension, smoking, <laughs> Uh, HDL cholesterol below 40 and family history in first degree relative uh, below 65 in women and 55 uh, in men. That's based on Framingham work. And then in addition to the two risk factors, here is the modulation with LDL level. Your risk was above 20%, LDL of 100 was enough. Your risk was between 10 and 20, your LDL had to be above 130. Your risk was below 10, LDL had to be above 160. This is greatly simplified where now it's the risk using the new function which involves stroke is greater than seven and a half and LDL has to be above 70. So the threshold is dropped and the LDL level is dropped in the new guideline. So what are the implications? Let's look at secondary prevention first. Uh, we're looking at adults 40 to 75 years of age and this is based on NHANES data. Um, 40 to 75 because the guideline is uh, quite clear of what the recommendation is. Below 40, there are a lot of options and uh, it's, uh, it's not a direct recommendation. Above 75, it gets interesting. The guideline says there is no evidence that starting statins above age 75 is beneficial. So we won't go into the controversy where to start and where not. We're looking at 40 to 75. So on therapy, in secondary prevention, people with prior CVD, we have 5.8 million people. Um, of those who are not on therapy, so the guidelines will make a difference, statin would be recommended in 3.6 million per ATP3, which means per ATP3, the old guideline, 3.6 million of people who should be considering statin uh, are not on statin, are not, not reporting taking statin. This number goes up to 6 million. The difference is the LDLC requirement b below 100 uh, is dropped from the new guideline. So primary prevention, where things get uh, more heated and controversial. On therapy, we have 19.4 million. Statin recommendation based on LDL above 190, that's identical because the criteria are identical. In diabetics, uh, we have 2.2 million increase with the new guideline because the LDL level was lowered uh, for initiation of therapy. And based on risk, so risk and modulation for ATP3, 6.9 million versus the whopping 15.1 million according to the new guideline. If we break it down by sex and age, we see very interesting patterns. In younger women, 40 to 59, the two guidelines don't differ. Uh, if we look at men, younger men, they differ minimally. 
if we look at older women, there is a substantial difference and there is a huge difference in older men. So in effect, the new guidelines are shifting their statin recommendation or increasing them uh, by the largest amount in older individuals, particularly in men. So a question uh, of the title of our debate, does cholesterol affect the new guideline? And I'm presuming, have Dr. Snyderman did not share with me his slides, presuming Dr. Snyderman will argue that it does not, where it, in fact, it does outside secondary prevention. So I capitulate in secondary prevention, lipids don't come in. If you have disease, you're recommended for statins in the new guidelines. Um, in primary prevention, lipids are present, not to the same extent as in ATP3, but still very present. People with diabetes qualify if LDLC is above 70, it's a fairly low bar. LDLC above 190 qualify automatically. People with high 10-year risk qualify if LDL is more than 70. Again, it's a low bar. In the 70 to 190 LDL range level, cholesterol enters through risk function. Okay? It's not to say lipids are not there. They're part of the 10-year risk calculation. And the 10-year risk calculator uses total and HDL cholesterol, which effectively is the non-HDL cholesterol. And from personal communication, I know that Dr. Snyderman is in possession of data showing that non-HDL cholesterol is better than LDL. So the function did it right. OK, so let's look how the recommendations may differ based on the lipid level. So let's take a 55-year-old African-American man, non-diabetic, non-smoker, not treated for systolic blood pressure, and the blood pressure is 130. If non-HDL is 100, so we can think about it, total cholesterol 160 and uh, HDL 60, the 10-year risk is 6.6, .6, so they would not be considered statin benefit. If it's 180, they would be on the border. If non-HDL is 200, they would be recommended for statin benefit. So clearly, cholesterol provides this gradation around the point, uh, the threshold point of seven and a half. 65 year old white woman, non diabetic, non smoker, treated systolic blood pressure 120. Again, we have 6.2 if non HDL is low, we have 8.3 if it's high, and if it's somewhat high, they are on the border. So lipids being part of the function still modulate. Uh, the risk. So some key implications uh, or implicit assumptions of the new guidelines. One important assumption is that statins work across all levels of cholesterol. That's a fundamental assumption and as a statistician I can't do anything else but be honest and say we don't know if this assumption is true. It needs to be tested. The main goal in primary prevention is to reduce the risk of future events. That's what the guidelines are implying, making it based on risk. Thus, statins are used to treat risk in effect and not lipid levels. This is in stark contrast to recent blood pressure guidelines, which said you treat based on your level of blood pressure. Risk does not come in at all. It's amazing to me how the two expert groups, one in uh, blood cholesterol, the other in hypertension, what dif how different their views of the world are uh, in terms of what needs to be done. Uh, age is a key factor in the guidelines. We saw the old versus young. There is the stroke interplay here. The new function includes strokes. Strokes come in at an older age, so age plays a more important role in the new guideline. It's the main driver of risk. But age quantifies the cumulative exposure to risk factors, which I think Dr. Snyderman would agree with as well. So the guidelines make it clear, it's important, that they are not intended as comprehensive guide to lipid management. Therefore, treatment of blood cholesterol to reduce risk of CVD, and that's the intention, and I'll stop here. Of course you do. Mic's not on. 
I am really behind the eight ball. <laughs> I, have, I, I can see this is the land of free speech. You get the right to throw it. I don't. <laughs> is this better? I will shout. Do you want to take mine? Let's, let's, let's silence me. I'll give you all the benefit of the doubt I can. <laughs> While we're waiting, I will concede Michael's point about conjecture. My point is not to, my, my intention is not to convince you of anything. I want to demonstrate, if I can, a way of understanding a problem. And we we formatted that in the terms of a debate. But the idea that I want to try and get across is that this isn't a discussion of guidelines. This is an attempt to understand better how we should prevent uh, atherosclerotic cardiovascular disease. Now, I am at a disadvantage for multiple reasons. Because the guidelines come with authority. AHA, ACC, Michael. <laughs> and they are based on risk. We do not, they don't tell you to use the dose of the drug based on the starting level of LDL cholesterol. They don't tell you to use the minimum dose of a drug to achieve the effect that you want. And that's a very profound difference in a therapeutic approach than I've ever actually heard before. Um, <laughs> Need I say more? <laughs> I, I'm the APOB guy, okay? There are three other people in this room who know that APOB is better than cholesterol. And I would humiliate them by identifying them. But all the rest of you don't. So I am an outsider with an alien viewpoint. <coughs> and this is the way I think about uh, atherosclerosis. Atherosclerosis, a key event, is the trapping of an ApoB particle, that's these guys, ApoB is the protein on the outside of the particle, within the arterial wall. That process occurs over time. This is a process that takes decades and decades and decades, and we know that for an absolute fact. And it's only when you develop advanced lesions that you are at risk of having something bad happen within the artery, which is more than just plaque rupture. We only speak about it as if the only bad event was rupture of a plaque with a clot. But there's multiple other ways that the integrity of the limb of the artery can be suddenly compromised and that you have a dead patient or a dead major portion of the heart. So the two principles are this process takes place incrementally and that by the time you get to having advanced disease, the artery has been irrevocably changed. You can't produce a normal artery when you start treating people who are at risk of an event because their arteries have already been changed over decades. And the other is that the, the chance of a particle entering the wall depends upon, the, in the first instance, on the number of particles in plasma. Now let me take, as Michael did, the new guidelines. But I'm going to start at age 40, which is already reasonably far along in the spectrum of developing disease. And I got a patient with a systolic blood pressure of 170, and their 10-year risk is 2.5% by the new calculator. There isn't a single doctor in this room who wouldn't treat them. Any doctor who didn't treat a blood pressure, a systolic blood pressure of 170, probably would go to jail because that's an extreme elevation of systolic blood pressure. But if you follow the risk paradigm, that patient is truly not at high risk in the next 10 years. They're not, okay? I'm making the same point that Michael made. There is an astonishing dissimilarity between the guidelines. Over time, that individual's risk will go up. When they're 55, they're obviously at high risk. 
If I took somebody with the equivalent LDL cholesterol, I made the number 170, okay? Uh, I can use numbers too. Uh, that's the 94th percentile of the American distribution. That's like high. That person is at low risk for the next 10 years, and that's correct, just like the blood pressure. And when they're 50, they still won't quite make the grade. But what do you think is happening during that time? Do you think nothing? That's the time during which the artery is being destroyed, following which the event which will, will occur that will either kill or cripple that patient. And uh, if you think that's bad for men, it's worse for women. Here's the women, uh, blood pressure, the 50-year-old women, I made it 50 to 70. A 50-year-old woman with a blood pressure of 170, applying the risk approach would not be treated. But of course, with the blood pressure would be. If she's a woman and we do the LDL cholesterol, she's never going to make the grade. Never going to make the grade. So if LDL really matters over in atherogenesis, and if LDL really matters over time, we should be concerned about how those numbers are. And therefore, we should look and see how secure is the risk model that they adopted. The foundational evidence is, and it's actually not in the document. The document doesn't say we did this because we proved this, this, and this. So I am imputing these, and Michael can argue that they're not correct imputations, but I would submit that it's foul play to produce a guideline without the reasoning that validates the decisions that are made. The absolute benefit of statin therapy is determined by the absolute risk of the patients who are treated. The evidence for this is that, as everybody knows, secondary prevention, you do more benefit than primary prevention. The relative benefit of the statin is independent of the level of LDL cholesterol. Heart protection state, they did demonstrate this. Heart protection, CTT, he's demonstrating yes, good, thank you. Because risk is the driver of benefit, further it's substantial reduction of residual LDL, of risk, is still possible at low levels of LDLC. So even if your LDL is low, if your risk is high, statin should help you. Okay, so let's look at secondary prevention. Here are 100 people with secondary prevention. They all have the disease. So they're all at risk. They're all at reasonably high risk. Their arteries are all diseased. They're not at identical risk, but they're all at considerable risk. In the darker green are the folks who actually had an infarct. And I had 20 of them have an infarct in my mind's eye. And then I treated with a statin, and I had four successes. So I saved four events. So that's pretty good. Here's primary prevention. And in primary prevention, the risk is lower. Everybody knows that. We only have four greenies here. Three of them had an event, and I saved one. They're correct. Secondary prevention, risk is higher. Treating the same number, benefit is higher. But let's look at that a little more carefully. All the people in secondary prevention are at high risk. They're homogeneous in that sense. In, secondary preve in primary prevention, is that a homogeneous group of people? By the magic invested in the cartoon, I will say they're not. I've got uh, 20 people on the right who had, a, you cannot have an infarct without advanced disease. And clinical trials are done for a five-year period. So most of the folks who have an event during the five years of a clinical trial of primary prevention, they already started with advanced disease. And during that time, a bad event occurred, the rupture of a plaque, whatever, a hemorrhage into the artery, and they had a, an event. So I, I saved one out of the four, but my population at true risk was 20. Then I've got the guys in the yellow and girls who don't have any significant disease. They were not at risk at all. They're making my denominator big. And then I've got the guys in the yellow, and I'm going to show you who they are in a minute. These are the people in whom failure to treat allowed the disease to progress so that one day after the clinical trial was over, they had an infarct. 
because the disease is progressing. You have to concede that because we know that's absolutely true about atherosclerosis. A clinical trial does not look at that. A clinical trial looks at, quote, clinical benefit. Fair enough. Fair enough. But that's not the only thing that happened during the trial. During the trial, there were people helped whose benefit would be realized after the trial. And we, I would submit, absolutely have to do trials to prove that this hypothesis is, this line of reasoning, it's not, the line of reasoning is correct. But I'm saying I've got a good a priori evidence base to say this is a, we, we, we undervalue the uh, value of early intervention if all we think about are clinical events during a five-year period. Primary prevention has two benefits, not just one. Is there evidence supporting the LDL benefit model? Well, the assertion that benefit of statin therapy relates principally to risk and is independent of the level of LDL contradicts all the evidence from the observational studies. Okay? And I see absolutely no reason why you abandon all that evidence. If statins work by pleiotropic mechanism without going through it in detail, the fact that the relation to benefit so closely correlates with the changes in LDL cholesterol, that means the two have to be linked if indeed the pleiotropic exists. If they were absolutely independent, you wouldn't find such a nice relationship. But let's go back to conventional wisdom. <coughs> this isn't Michael's conventional wisdom. This is the conventional wisdom of the clinicians. The relative benefit, the percent reduction of events per given dose of statin is independent of the level of LDLC. That's the prime statement of the heart protection study in the CTT meta-analysis. Simvastatin 40 reduces risk by 20%. Therefore, the risk, the prediction is, if that's correct, the benefit from statin therapy will be substantial as long as absolute risk is substantial. Even at low levels of LDL, substantial further benefit is possible. Second core piece of conventional wisdom, benefit is constant for constant decrease in LDL cholesterol. Risk decreases by 20% per millimole uh, per liter decrease in LDLC. And the interpretation of this statement has been that benefit is independent of the level of LDLC. Now, what's the evidence? The test of a, a model is take the extremes. What's the evidence that statins work at low levels of LDL? It's not the heart protection study. People say that the heart protection study demonstrated that benefit with people with an LDL cholesterol below 80 benefited just as much as people with an LDL cholesterol higher. Actually, the method they used to measure LDL cholesterol was a direct assay, and it was not very good. It was off by 20 milligrams per deciliter. So actually, they were talking about people with 100. A little technical error there. It was not the Jupiter study. The LDL and non-HDL cholesterol levels in Jupiter were truly low. But ApoB, which is the number of particles, was not low. So Jupiter doesn't work for you. TNT is one of the studies that's quoted, but that's not actually true because if you look at the text, the entry level, the baseline LDL cholesterol, that's after 10 milligrams of atorvastatin. They were at 155 before they were treated. Low LDL trials have failed. AIM high, HPS2, Thrive, DAL, outcomes. Now, I'm throwing those in there even though different drugs were involved because the guidelines threw them in there. They argued that as evidence for their point of view. Statins don't always reduce cardiovascular risk when cardiovascular risk is high. Your hemo patients, okay? Now, I've had some lipid people say to me, but they don't count. I mean, they're so obviously different. Well, what's so obviously different about them? They die of cardiovascular disease. If your model is, it's independent, it's got to be truly independent. And it isn't because it failed in hemo consistently. It didn't work in heart failure. I didn't do the study, they did. Their hypothesis was that it would work. It didn't. What's the evidence that statin benefit is related to baseline LDL? Actually, quite a bit. Imperfect, totally conceded, it's imperfect. But it's not absent. Care, lipid, prove it, HPS, oh dear, HPS and CTT. There was a meta now, I'm not gonna go through all this stuff with you, but I'm gonna take a little bit of it. In the heart protection study, the best known, one of the best known results of the heart protection study was a secondary result, which is sort of absurd because it was the primary result that we really counted. 
And it was that the benefit was independent of the start, the relative benefit was independent of the starting level of LDL cholesterol. Within the same figure, which is figure eight, we're into figure eight before we get to this stuff. Uh, these are the baseline levels of LDL cholesterol and outcome. And the only point I want to make is that within this trial, in which risks varied amongst the participants, but they're all in there, one of the predictors of outcome was LDL cholesterol, both in the placebo and treated group. We've taken the results of CTT, Ken Williams, the statistician I work with, and said, if you put all this placebo control trials in there, is there a relationship between baseline LDL cholesterol and outcome? And actually, there is. The higher the LDL cholesterol we've adjusted for the intensity of therapy, the higher the baseline level, the, uh, the greater the benefit. Now, do heart protection and CTT really show benefit as independent of the level of LDL cholesterol? This is key. If reducing LDL cholesterol by one millimole reduces risk by 20%, I'm accepting what they say, okay? It follows that the absolute benefit of a statin is driven by the absolute benefit of LDL, the absolute level of LDL because higher levels of LDL mean there are more millimoles of LDL cholesterol to reduce. This is not higher math. The relation between LDL and risk is exponential, not linear. Therefore, the risk of LDL relates to the absolute level of LDL. You know what? Statins reduce LDL by a constant percent, not a constant amount. So if I give somebody Lipitor 40, I'll get more of a drop from a high level than from a low level. So my one millimole that gets me 20%, I can get that with the same dose of a medication the higher the level of LDL cholesterol. To make that simple point perfectly obvious, here's patient A and patient B. And I am going to successively reduce patients A LDL cholesterol from, I did it millimoles because it's easy. Because CTT and HPS are millimoles, sorry guys. Right. But um, it's 40 of your milligrams, 38.5 of your milligrams. But, if you go from five to four, you get 20%. Four to three, you get 20% of that, you get 80% of that. So by the time I'm down to two, I got 60% decrease, okay? If I'm starting at three and I go to two, I can only get 20%. I can only do that trick once. I submit, therefore, that CTT and HPS absolutely demonstrate that the starting level of LDL cholesterol matters. And, and doctors should adjust the intensity of their therapy in light of that. And therefore, I submit that the new guidelines are not evidence-based. These are data from Malcolm Law uh, uh, back in 2003. And the truth is, I don't actually know how he did the calculations, and I've given it to Michael. And I don't, it, it just isn't in the paper, but they're really cool. And expected decrease in ischemic heart disease events based on decrease in LDL cholesterol and age-based 10 largest cohort studies. These guys made the point that the benefit depended upon the level which I've already shown you. If you're 50 years of age and you go down by 2.2 millimoles, you, get a, you should get an 84% reduction event versus 39% for 0.6 moles, okay? So higher, the person with the higher LDL benefits more than the person with the lower LDL, which shouldn't surprise you since statins work by lowering LDL. This is not, this is not exactly revolutionary. The other point that's on this slide, which is totally amazing, and, 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 I, and I, that's where I wish I understood how he actually done it, is showing you the difference in benefit that you get starting at age 50. This is a calculation, not a demonstration. If you start early, you do better than if you start late. And that's the key unknown. And I, and I stipulate I don't know that. But to me, if I'm going to counsel my patient on what I do know about vascular disease, starting earlier should be better because the amount of disease in the wall will be less advanced. And it's the disease in the wall that determines the outcome. I'm getting to the end. This, this is... This is how I think atherosclerosis works. Uh, age 20, 
you could argue maybe there's some stuff there or not. But by age 40 in a man, there are many people who already have well-developed lesions. They're well on their way. We're developing some technology to be able to identify these people, but I think a coronary calcium, you're really pretty advanced by the time a calcium goes really positive. And, but you're at the, the, on this slide, I'm demonstrating the incidence of events. Coronary events don't become common in men until after 60. Okay? So if we wait till, this is when risk starts to go up. If we wait till when risk starts to go up to intervene, we're closing the barn door after it's been open for 45 years. That is not the strategy that I will choose to advise my patients as the appropriate study because it violates everything I know about the biology of the disease. My conclusions. <coughs> we know, actually know a lot about what causes atherosclerosis. But we know almost nothing about what triggers events. If, what does a prediction of 7.5% mean? I don't actually understand what the heck it, it means. Do I have a, if it tells me I have a 7.5% chance, it means I, does it mean I have a 90% chance that nothing's going to happen? Because I'm either going to have the event or not. Uh, I only get through by whatever period of time I've got once. I can't repeat it 100 times. If it's a group we're talking about, Actually, that falls apart for lots of other reasons. The, what does this idea of risk actually mean when you get down to it? If I'm telling you that your risk is 15%, is it you or a group of people that look something like you? If I base your estimate on risk, that's an extremely heterogeneous group because it'll be driven by age and gender. Age and gender are the dominant determinants of risk. LDL, whether it comes in as total cholesterol or ApoB, whatever, it almost minimally affects that because of the slide that I showed you before. It takes time for these things to injure the wall. That time, you're aging. So of course age is the most important predictor of risk. But age isn't just how old you are. It's the length of time that your arteries have been injured. If I come and keep slapping your face, once you'll let me, get, but if I keep doing that, that's what's actually going on. Your arteries are being injured minute by minute, hour by hour, week by week, incrementally, slowly, and they're being transformed. And I think that if I'm dealing with the one person who's in front of me, I would counsel them if I can identify an aberrancy, a high level of something I know to be really bad, that at a reasonable age where you can do benefits and costs, and I don't mean cost to society, but benefit costs in terms of your risk to the patient, that, that I would, I'm more interested in prevention than prediction. I, I, I don't think we actually know very precisely how to predict who's going to have an infarct. 7.5% is over 10 years. An infarct occurs in an instant. One instant. The plaque ruptures, bang, you're done. There are a lot of instants in 10 years. What's a 7.5% chance of an instant? So those aren't the odds I would want to take myself. Those aren't the odds that I would counsel my patients to. What am I really in favor of? I'm not in favor of what the guidelines said, for lots of reasons. With due respect, because they're, they're good people, they're, I, don't doubt the, I don't doubt the integrity or the effort or the intelligence they brought to it. I just think there's a phenomenon known as groupthink, and it can result in less than the best decisions. And if we learn anything from these processes, it should be to change the process. Second thing is, I, I think LDL is important, but I, clearly it's not the whole answer. And I'm in favor of a new <laughs> model that, that in which we understand how things happen over time, in which we say our knowledge is incomplete. We know enough to be able to do a lot, but we don't know some of the most important questions, such as whether earlier intervention will, will produce the kind of doubling of benefit that I think it will, 
compared to later intervention. And what the hell does early mean? What decade are we talking about? How much pills are we talking about? Or is it only pills? So I don't, I think that notwithstanding the enormous progress that's been made over the time that I've been privileged to be a cardiologist, it's, it's incredible. We haven't, if we think we've understood this problem, that's the single biggest mistake that we can make. We have enough that we should be able to now really go at this and figure out how to, I believe, be able to take the incidence of vascular disease not down 30%, but 80, 90%. Thank you so much. I have the opportunity to respond. I think the uh, call for agreement, uh, I cannot help by, but agree with it. So this is, this is the good news. So let me start with the, the things I, I agree on. And I, I do agree that the model adopted by the new guidelines is good only for what it intends to do. It's a 10-year model. And if we want to avoid or predict disease in 10 years, this model is good. I also agree that in younger people, we probably should look at a longer horizon. And in fact, I can say that I'm the only person who's created a model that enables people to look at the longer 30-year uh, horizon. I will not tell you why this model is not uh, as popularly used as it should be. It just uh, had some editorial troubles at, at one point. Um, so we do, need, we do need a better model uh, and uh, look uh, more long term. Now, Dr. Snyderman, you're giving us the impression that there is an LDL stratification. So if we go to your slide called figure eight, can we, do we have a way of, I, I guess, have a way of going back, this one. And so you said that risk depends on baseline level of LDL. Well, this is obvious, we agree with that. LDL stratifies risk. But there is a difference between univariate approach and multivariable approach, okay? LDL is one of the risk factors that stratifies your risk. Based on your argument, you should decide who needs to be treated based on LDL alone, which I don't think that's what you would uh, propose. You also said that age is a measure of exposure over time, which I totally agree with. But then the model they are using, the 10-year model, it would, it, which is imperfect, well, age is an important player. So it takes into account the exposure over time, right? You probably, would you agree that in older people, as a result, those above 60, they are getting statins because the exposure is taken into account, so probably the guidelines are okay. Yes? <laughs> Yes or no, is that? <laughs> uh, uh, I have to say no, because otherwise uh, uh, I, this would be hopeless. <laughs> okay, well, so, but I, I think there is, we'll agree there is less controversy in the older group. At I, least in your presentation, your examples focused on the 40-year-olds and 50-year-olds. I, I don't think that 90% of men over 60 should be taking a statin just because they're over 60. I think that's a reflection of our ignorance. Uh, I can't deny that men over 60 are higher at higher risk than men under 60. Of course they are. But if we have to say that by the time you're 60, everybody starts a statin, that means we don't know how to select the people who are truly at risk. That's another area in which I think we need to do research. Would you say that somebody who's uh, 70, who has hypertension um, and a family history but an LDL of 70 benefits from a statin. Uh, well, I, as a statistician, I have the liberty of being honest, and I'll say I don't know. <laughs> there is clinical trial data, then we can look at the question. We can look at the interplay between risk and LDL level. That research has not been done. So Dr. Snyderman conjectured that higher LDL implies greater benefit. But higher LDL is very correlated with higher risk. LDL or non-HDL is one of the parts of the risk equation. 
I hypothesize that when we look at people stratified by LDL and stratified by a risk model that has cholesterol as one of its parts and maybe an extended horizon risk model, that stratification will be quite similar. And I think knowing that the other factors are at play is helpful in the decision. So the risk prediction does help rather than taking a view that LDL or any lipid, ApoB, is the only thing that matters. Okay, so I, maybe I'll, uh, I'll stop here and uh, we'll open it up uh, for questions or comments. So, so that was, those were two great presentations, so thanks, thanks a lot, and it's a really interesting um, topic. Can you guys both talk a little bit about risk, think about risk versus modifiable risk? I mean, because, I mean, presumably there, uh, Dr. Snyderman, I think you alluded to, there's, you know, there's some patients who are at risk, and what we care about is whether that risk is modifiable or not. And then just one other comment. Would this all, the risk we're talking about is all the risk of events, and presume, you know, sort of, uh, and if statins were infinite, were free, and had no side effects, um, no, no risks, then one could make the argument that you should just treat everybody because there'd be, there'd be no downside. But how do we think about the adverse effects, maybe including cost in, in these equations? Modifiable. I mean, modifiable are the things that we can change. And we can change the level of LDL. We can change the level of blood pressure. <clears throat> when you change the level of blood pressure, you introduce more real risk than when you change the level of LDL. The side effects of hypotension are a lot more clinically relevant than the side effects of a statin. One of the drawbacks, however, of being a physician in the age of statins is listening to people complain about muscle aches. Okay? It's a major problem. As you know, somebody takes a statin, they have a muscle ache, you have to stop it. You try to get them to continue, you have no lab test that tells you whether it's statin related. Uh, you negotiate, you do your tricky tricks, uh, and very frequently the patient stops taking any statin. So in the new guidelines, and this is an issue that's not fair to put to Michael, we're told to use the highest doses that the patient can tolerate. Now the side effects relate to the dose. And I, I think it's an intolerable breach of normal clinical practice to say you start with the highest dose. Because if the lowest dose for me gets the ApoB down, which it, it may, because statins, you get 75% of the effect with your first dose. 80 is not eight times more than 10 in terms of effect. I think we'll have better real life outcomes because our adherence will be higher. And I don't think these people have taken adherence into account. And uh, I don't deny that more LDL lowering is better. It's progressively less better, but in, pr in principle there's some. But there's a trade-off that's real. There's a trade-off where what you're doing is getting such a small. And compared to when you start, that's my main point. Starting earlier will produce far more long-term. And Michael said it absolutely correctly, and I didn't. The fundamental disagreement I have with these guidelines is they're 10 years. And that was okay in 1980. Arguably, it was okay in 1990. But we've been using these drugs for 20 years now. Where are they? A 10-year window, that's the fundamental error. Once you do that, everything else, all the logic follows. You can't treat the 40-year-old, because it's true, okay? But, but most of the people I see who are 40 would like to know what's likely to happen to them before they're 65. That's a reasonable question for a human being to ask. And we've been truncated artificially, arbitrarily by this 10-year, which was the data we had, how many years ago, 30 years ago? 30 years ago, 40 years ago, it's crazy. Well, I, I think we're starting to converge as, as the author of the only 30-year model in existence. I definitely, <laughs> I definitely agree with Dr. Snyderman that we do need uh, a longer-term perspective uh, for, uh, for assessment. 
I still have an issue with, I guess, the way to which we modify the risk factors. So the, the older age, we can, we can see which of the people don't need the treatment. But in the younger age, here are the examples that Dr. Snyderman used, the young people that he'd like to give statins to. But what about two things? One is lifestyle intervention. Why won't we try to push the 40-year-olds in the example to change their lifestyle and see if their lipids get better, you still have time based on risk, okay? And also to be clear, I'm defending the risk-based approach, and I think we're agreeing that risk-based approach based on a uh, longer horizon is the right way uh, to go about it. I'm not defending the other pieces of the guidelines, things like should they have the highest dose and so on. I don't have the expertise for it, and it doesn't sound quite right to me, but I, I, <laughs> I'm not making uh, I'm not making any, any determination there, but we, we need a longer term risk horizon. So, but in the younger people, why not give a chance to lifestyle intervention? The second thing is risk prediction models have been taken as a dogma. Okay, now you have a risk, you have a guideline, and you have a computer that in the past was called a doctor who is gonna tell you <laughs> what to do with it. That's not what statisticians who started risk prediction intended. Risk prediction, risk models were intended to supplement doctors' knowledge. Okay, help them and be one of the tools in addition. If there is a patient that you have an obvious recommendation, you should follow the recommendation and not listen to the model. It's not a diagnostic, it's not a computerized uh, yes or no thing, it's, it's a tool. It's one of the tools that doctors should use and I think my, my hope and, uh, would be that doctors will take the guidelines and will apply them thoughtfully rather than applying them automatically. Right, Dr. Snyderman? No, I'm, <laughs> no, I'm worried. I'm worried. I'm worried that we won't interpret. I, I'm worried that an individual doctor will feel overwhelmed and not be able to um, say what he or she thinks. Because how can each one of us pretend to stand against the American Heart Association? I mean, I totally take your point about lifestyle. Um, I mean, I, I, I do that with all the people I see because I think that when you can walk and run and do whatever, you can enjoy life. E even if it didn't make you live longer, which I'm not quite sure we, ha we got good evidence. I mean, I, 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 unless I'm visiting you, I run a bit in the morning and I, I try and play golf when we can in the, and I'm in the bushes all the time, so it's a good workout <laughs> for me. So I, I, this isn't either or. But when it comes down to the notion, and I, and I don't treat anybody for a lifetime. I think that is a horrific, I write a prescription for three months, longest ever is six months. And then you review in the light of what you know six months later, in the light of what a paper has been written or a colleague has said or what, what you realized you were wrong about before. None of it, it, it becomes a mistake when people think we're doing, we're on a 30 year mindless decision. And we're not. I don't want to lose anybody right now in case it's the right idea. When we started using statins, we didn't have clinical trials. Uh, we didn't have the evidence that um, they really were beneficial. We didn't know, for example, after 4S that it would work in diabetics. But did we start treating people with diabetes? Of course we did. Because it seemed like a good idea and there wasn't much of a downside and there was an amazing clinical problem. So the notion, one of the things I object to is that evidence, just as you said, that the randomized controlled clinical trial is the only evidence in the game. It isn't. This is an interpretive art of very considerable difficulty. This is a profession that's been around for a long time and it's an extremely difficult profession if you're gonna do it professionally. And it means that you gotta keep your head clear to figure out exactly what tactic you're gonna take with that particular, with the particular patient who's in front of you. So I don't think we could agree more actually. Uh, I, 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 Michael's saying his 30 year thing, nobody used, actually I did, okay? Because it made total sense to me. Uh, and and I, I, I never met a patient who didn't understand the thinking ahead 30 years. A lifetime, I never met a patient who really did get that one straight, okay? But 30 years, people could count from where they were and see where they, would, where they wanted to be. That made total sense to me and I'd do whatever I could to try and get us back on that path.
path to projecting a reason the people can see what's likely to happen to them over a reasonable period of time, given what we know about the efficacy and safety of statins. Great. Well, thank you for a very healthy uh, and enlightening debate, and um, we'll be around for a few minutes afterwards if folks have questions. Please welcome, uh, please join me in thanking our, our visiting speaker again. Thanks. Thank you.